Well, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty and loving Father, we thank you for this uh, this time to be back together again, um, and we are uh, looking forward to getting into your word and studying peacemaking. And uh, we are thankful for one another and for the opportunity to pray for one another. Be with those that we have lifted up today, whether they need healing or traveling mercies, uh, whether uh, they are personal needs or community or, or national needs, uh, whether it be um, uh, a, uh, something close to home or far away, uh, and, and celebrate with us in, in our celebrations. And uh, we thank you that you uh, are, are a giver of all good and perfect gifts, and you rejoice when we rejoice, too. Uh, illuminate the word for us, uh, open its uh, meaning to us and, and to our minds and to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, I, we don't probably spend a whole lot of time in First Chronicles, but go ahead and turn to First Chronicles. Remember, that's not First Corinthians. Where's First Chronicles? Old, Old Testament or New Testament? Old Testament. Okay. And and um, First Chronicles. Chapter 22, because it might take, you might need some, uh, you might need to, now, uh, uh, Lee, I see your maps, are, are, are your maps in the, in the front? Oh no, they fell out, okay, your maps <laughs> fell out of the back, and now they're in the front. You know, that's what they said, uh, somebody said they read the Bible all the way from Genesis to maps. <laughs> um, this, uh, whole series will be on peacemaking and that has to do with inter inner peace uh, outer peace local peace peace around the world uh, every kind of peace and by the time we study four kinds of peace we're gonna we're gonna really cover peacemaking and um, we're gonna have some good thoughts uh, some things to think about and sometimes we'll have questions that have, that the Bible gives us answers. Sometimes the Bible gives us new questions that we weren't asking or um, makes us think about things in a new way. But the one for today is an Old Testament. In fact, I think, yes, of the four that we're doing, this is the only one from the Old Testament. And we're going to look at the, at the old question of Basically, why is there so much violence in the Old Testament? And does that mean that God was more violent back then? Was there less peacemaking back then? Was that, you know, is that, is there, what, what do we do with that? Um, and so we're going to look at, at uh, a few chapters here about the transition from David to Solomon. Now, David was a king and Solomon was a king. And how were they related? Do you remember? Father and son. David was the father. Solomon was the son. And in 1 Chronicles, um, if you keep your finger at, at, at chapter 22 and flip back to chapter 17, if your Bible, chapter 17, if your Bible has little headers at the top, you know, little headings and stuff, you might see things like in chapter 17, God making a covenant with David, okay? So we're just sort of picking up the context here. And then in chapter 18, uh, establishing the kingdom under David. And then in chapter 19, David defeats the... Ammonites and the Arameans. And in chapter 20, he captures Rabbah. And then in chapter 21, uh, Satan uh, is sent to get David to do a census and make sure he has enough troops. But God is upset. Uh, with David for even counting the troops. 
saying, basically, I'm going to provide you with the victory, so why are you counting the troops? Um, and so the Lord sends a pestilence on Israel and punishes Israel for, and for David doing this, and David too. And then um, David makes a sacrifice, and then we get to our reading. So David has been the war king. You see that? David's been a war king. In fact, he's, he's, a, he's also a poet. You know, he writes those psalms and all that. But he's a warrior king. And when we get to uh, chapter 22, we start hearing about Solomon. And we're going to do the reading in just a moment. But basically, what you're going to see here is a transition from David to Solomon. And Solomon is not going to be the war king. He's going to be the builder king. The builder king. What's he going to build? The temple. The temple. Right. Okay. So let's look. Uh, let me just see if I've covered all my, yeah, my, my stuff. Okay. So we've got a military king and a temple king. Okay. Chapter 22, verse 2. David prepares to build the temple. David gave orders to gather together the aliens who were residing in the land of Israel, and he set stone cutters to prepare dressed stones for building the house of God. David also provided the great stores of iron for nails for the doors of the gates and for clamps, as well as bronze in quantities beyond weighing and cedar logs without number. For the Sidonians and the Tyrians brought great quantities of cedar to David. For David said, My son Solomon is young and inexperienced, and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent, famous and glorified throughout all lands. I will therefore make preparation for it. So David provided materials in great quantity before his death. Then he called for his son Solomon, and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son, I have planned to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Here's where, here's where I want you to pay attention. You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name, because you have shed so much blood in my sight on the earth. Curious, isn't it? See, a son shall be born to you. He shall be a man of peace. I will give him peace from all his enemies on every side, for his name shall be Solomon, which actually means uh, peace, or is related to the meaning of peace. Um, and I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be a son to me. And I will be a father to him, and I will establish my, his royal throne in Israel forever. Now, my son, the Lord be with you. This is David talking to Solomon. So that you may succeed in building the house of the Lord your God, as he has spoken concerning you. Only may the Lord grant you discretion and understanding, so that when he gives you the charge over Israel, you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Then you will prosper if you are careful to observe the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord commanded Moses for Israel. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed. With great pains I have provided for the house of the Lord 100,000 talents of gold, 1 million talents of silver and bronze and iron beyond weighing. There is so much of it. Timber and stone too I have provided. To these you must add more. You have an abundance of workers, stone cutters, masons, carpenters, all kinds of artisans without number and skilled in working gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Now begin the work, and the Lord be with you. And David also commanded all the leaders of Israel to help his son Solomon, saying, Is not the Lord your God with you? Has he not given you peace on every side? For he has delivered the inhabitants of the land into my hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and his people. Now set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. Go and build the sanctuary of the Lord God so that the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God may be brought into a house built for the name of the Lord. 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, at the start of the chapter, it kind of, you might think that David was going to build the, the uh, temple himself. And he thought he was going to build it himself. He even says that his, in verse 5, that his son is too inexperienced. Yet in the very next verse, he comes to his senses in verse 6. And he said, tells Solomon to build the temple. And David cited a word he heard from the Lord. Remember that in verse 8? What was the reason in verse 8 that David, that God said David can't build the temple? He shed too much blood. He shed too much blood. But wait a minute. Who told him to go shed that blood? Yes. The Lord God. So there's something, something curious going on here. There's something for us to, uh, to figure out about when God says make war and God says, wait a minute, make peace. And even the name Solomon comes from shalom, which means peace. So this is already, we've got a puzzle to figure out. So that's the mystery of the day. So everybody put on your, you know, uh, uh, your thinking caps and your uh, Sherlock Holmes hats. What do you call those hats? Those deer hunter hats? Deer stalkers. Deer stalkers. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, what are you thinking, Lee? One question. It's an obvious question, but is the Lord displeased with David? So that's that's what we're going to need to look at. We're going it, to, it, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's not clear that he is displeased. And we're going to talk about what does it mean. What we so when we hear you shed too much blood, we think you were too violent. But there could be another meaning. And that's what I want to unpack. So David suddenly knows that Solomon should build the temple, um, and we shouldn't feel too bad for David. According to verse one through five, he amassed the materials to build the temple. So I'm going to get I'm going to get to your your question, Lee. but he amassed the materials. But how did he amass all those materials? By plundering other nations, By plundering other nations as see. God gave them, you know. And then there were some tributes that were sent too, like. But those were pretty much because. In other words, the booty. That they was the booty, right? But and then the and then some then some stuff was sent to him, partly because. Uh, they wanted to stay on his good side too. And they didn't want him coming back around over there anymore. Well, also it says that, that he brought in the aliens from other countries to do the work. I mean, that's another plundering in a way. There it is. That is the human factor. It is. So um, these other nations, they want to be in David's favor. But Solomon will be the temple builder and he receives Father's blessing. Uh, he even says to his son, be strong and be brave, don't lose heart, be courageous, things like that. There's, there's no evidence, at least if you just read it you know, straight here. I can't, I can't make a case for, to say that David is bitter about this. Like I, we, we might, it, I think if we see that, we're kind of reading that in because he doesn't seem bitter. He's blessing his son when it comes time for it to happen. So um, David has fulfilled his role, and though he said his son is inexperienced, he trusts God to build the temple. Now in chapter 18, so flip back over here to chapter 18. In verse 6 and verse 13, they both say that something similar. They've got different names of different countries, but they both say one thing, the last sentence is, is the same. What does it say in your Bible at the end of 6 and at the end of 13? The Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. You see that in 6 and 13? But in chapter 21, David's actions are his own. Now, Remember, chapter 21 is the one where, um, where Satan is 
sent to tell him to go count his uh, army and take a census. And he does, and then God is displeased. And, and, um, and he has to, uh, let's see. Uh, the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel and an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. Because why do you, what, what was it about David's census that made God so mad? A lack of faith. Lack of trust, right? And he didn't have to take a census. It's curious that later Jesus says, what king goes to war without counting his armies? <laughs> okay, well, well, anyway. Um, but in chapter 21, David's actions are his own. God observes them and brings judgment on David. Perhaps the Lord felt that David had been stepping out too far on his own, as Moses did when he didn't follow his instructions, God's instructions. Do you remember a story when Moses didn't follow God's instructions to the letter? What happened? Kind of like he was a speak to the rock, but he struck it. He did it. He did it out of order or something like that. He didn't get to go to the promised land. And he didn't get it. He had to die and never got to go in before the, he could go in the promised land. He lived outside and died. In David's history, he kind of ran off ahead of doing his own thing in a lot of places. He wasn't the best guy. No, when he was younger, <laughs> right. I mean, you've got, you got Bathsheba, uh, Amy Raya, you've got um, Saul and Saul's madness and all that kind of stuff going on. David's had, yeah, David's had uh, quite a history. Now, so we're told that David, the Lord gave David the victory wherever he went, but then he messed up. What about all the times in the old, all the times in the Old Testament that God sent the Israelites to conquer lands and shed blood? What about the Exodus journey to the Promised Land and the victories God gave Moses over the Canaanites? Those were bloody. They were. They were bloody. We should admit that the ways of Israel coming into the Promised Land were bloody. But, but they were what God said to do. I'm not, you know, it's, it is what God's will and what he wanted them to do. Such conflicts are not nice. They are brutal and violent. But it depends on the, your perspective depends a lot on, on who you are. If you're the Israelites, you don't, you might, and you're writing the history, you might not write about all the mean, bad things you did. You might write about how the Lord gave you victory. But if you're the Canaanites, you're going to write about all those Israelites who came and took your land. During that time in Israel's history, it was written down that Israel and Judah, during that time, compared to the other countries around them, were not very big. And, you know, when they came from the Exodus and came into the, into the Promised Land, um, they were second or third generation uh, warriors who had grown up in the wilderness. And I'm not sure how organized of an army they had. I'm not sure how much experience they had. You know, it, they, they may have not been the fiercest, most feared warriors. They might not have had armor. They might have had rudimentary weapons. Um, but what we're going to do now is put a, put a finger or something, put a paper or something into, into this passage. And we're going to go back to a whole other story to try to answer Lee's question over here about the, the blood and, and that kind of thing. So we're going to go back to Numbers. Now remember where Numbers is? What, what are the five first books in the Bible, the books of Moses? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Right. So right after Leviticus. Okay? And we're going to go to Numbers chapter 31. Did you fall right on it? Uh, no, pen, oh, yes, Pentateuch, the five, pens of five, five books. Uh, okay. Um, 
Now, uh, I'm going to read, I'm going to basically um, read this, and I know it's a bit long, but, but watch what happens with the blood and the priests after this war. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Avenge the Israelite, avenge the Israelites on the Midianites. In other words, go fight the Midianites. Afterward you shall be gathered to your people. So Moses said to the Lord, Arm some of your number for the war, so they may go against Midian to execute the Lord's vengeance on Midian. Send a thousand from each tribe of Israel. Uh, again, I'm kind of fast forwarding. So so out of the thousands of Israel, a thousand from each tribe went. Uh, Twelve thousand armed for battle. Moses sent them to war. A thousand from each tribe. Okay. Uh, come down. They, verse 7. They did battle against Midian. Uh, verse 8. They killed the kings of Midian. Verse 9. The Israelites took the women of Midian and their little ones captive and all their cattle and their flock and their goods and their booty. And then verse 10. All the towns where they had settled, all their encampments were burned took all the spoils, people and animals, and that verse 12, they brought them to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the congregation. So you got, you got that. Everybody's with us, right? Now, when they return, verse 13, Moses, Eleazar the priest, and all the leaders of the congregation met, went, went to meet them outside the camp. Moses became angry with the officers of the army, the commanders of thousands, and the commanders of hundreds who had come from service in the war. Whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> I know Doug's over there like, huh? <laughs> have you, Moses said, have you allowed all the women to live? These women here, on Balaam's advice, made the Israelites act treacherously against the Lord in the affair of Peor, so the plague came upon the congregation of the Lord. Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones. Ah, I know. Are you getting? Are you losing your appetite yet? And kill every woman who has known a man by sleeping with him. But all the young girls who have not known a man by sleeping with him, keep alive for yourselves. This is Moses talking. Uh huh. <laughs> Camp outside the camp seven days. Now, here's the part, important part. I mean, I know the rest was gross, but here's the important part. Whoever of you has killed any person or touched a corpse, purify yourselves and your captives on the third and on the seventh day. You shall purify every garment, every article of skin, everything made of goat's hair, every article of wood. All right. So, and then Eleazar goes on to repeat that in verse 12, 23. Everything that can withstand fire shall be passed through fire and shall be clean. Nevertheless, it shall also be purified with the water for purification, and whatever cannot withstand fire shall be passed through the water. You must wash your clothes on the seventh day, and you shall be clean. Afterward, you may come into the camp. Okay, the reason we're reading that is they did all this killing. They went back and killed the women and the and the young men, and they brought the women and the possessions back. And Eleazar and Moses insist that the spoils of war be put through the fire and the water of purification. All right, just hang with me here, okay? The sold because we're now we're at the now we're at the good, at the payoff. The soldiers' clothes had to be washed and left for seven days before they would be allowed back into the camp. In other words, the blood of the enemies was not to come into proximity to the ritually pure tabernacle and Israel's camp. The point is that there was a difference in Israelite culture between ritual uncleanliness from the blood and moral culpability. Moral culpability meaning that you're guilty of slaughter and murder and nasty stuff. The Lord did not consider the shedding of blood of Israel's enemies to be morally abhorrent. The issue was the purification. Okay? We may not, that may sit real weird with you, but the issue was the purification. 
And that's why they had to stay outside. Not because they did so much violence, but because that blood was not was not allowed near the tabernacle and the and and the camp. Taylor? Yeah. It appeared that there wasn't enough killing done. And, right. He was he said he said, How dare you come back here after what they did to us? Go back and, you know, kill the women and things like that. What the women did, what did they do to the Israelites? He was referring to um, uh, how the Israelites um, uh, in the affair of Peor. P, uh, that's in verse 16. And I'm not really sure. I'd have to go back and look, but I think it was. But they issued it the first time that they run into each other. Right. I think this was a vengeance. This was a, a, a revenge act. Okay. Uh, now hang with me here. If a warrior king like David had too much blood on his hands, so jumping up to David now, David and Solomon, then he may be judged by the Lord to be ritualistically pure enough. He Then he, he might not be ritualistically pure enough to build the temple. So David might have not been the temple builder because he had so much blood. Not because having not because God thought he had been too violent. As we can see that <laughs> there's a lot some some they had Moses and the other guys be a lot more violent. But because it was ritualistically impure. By cementing Solomon as the temple builder, David's dynasty is secured. David gave Solomon authority, the necessary building materials, and his blessing. A parallel can be drawn between Joshua as a successor to Moses, who for similar reasons Moses was not permitted to enter the promised land. So Moses couldn't enter the promised land because he messed up with the rock. David couldn't finish the temple because he messed up uh, with the uh, counting in the census. Okay. Is everybody is everybody with me? Are you following along? Are you totally confused? Okay. Help. What are, what are your what questions? Let's take a minute and kind of process some questions here. But why wouldn't um, God give David a, a way of purification like He did in, in Numbers? You know, I don't know. I really don't know. That's a good question. Pam asked, "Why did would God not give David a way of purification?" Like he did for the warriors. Well, you don't really back. know that he didn't. He was old. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was that was one. Might of have been other reasons. Yeah. Besides. To me, that was. I mean, that, you know, he said he he was said he was old and he needed to pass on the. Yeah. I think of Queen Elizabeth. You know, people kept saying, "Why is she not passing the throne?" You know, her <laughs> responsibility. The crown. At some point, you have to do it with your children. Mm -hmm. As they get older, you realize that sometimes they have more wisdom than you do. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's what I hear you saying. Maybe it's just going to take a while. Yes. And we, you know, God has a purpose for each of us. Right. Yes. Okay, it was not David's purpose. Right. Mm. Right. God wanted the temple built by a peaceful man, a peaceful person. And, and, and maybe and that we, might be we all important. have our, our responsibilities on the earth, and that was David had fulfilled. Yeah. His responsibility. Yeah. And also look, it, it also goes back to, in, from you know, ancient history to more recent history in the 20th century. Uh, Churchill was, uh, was seen as the war prime minister. As soon as his purpose was done in the war, uh, as, as being a war prime minister, he was voted out of office. His time, uh, his term, of, of what he was to do to save the country of Great Britain was done. Uh, another prime minister, Clinton Attlee, was to, was to, I guess, bring in what, well, like Solomon, period, preside over peace. So the the, 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 uh, the idea of God working in history, uh, whether it was back in ancient times to modern times, does have a purpose, mm -hmm. and that. Uh, just like uh, Saul did not want to uh, 
to give up his time when his time was over. It was David's. Mm -hmm. that he was he was forced out, and David was. But God was telling David, uh, even if you like being uh, the instrument of what I had to do, your time is over, and uh, your son is going to be succeeding you. Mm -hmm. And it means that our time in history, even though man can transcend it, such as other creatures and create creatures can't, that we all have our time, and that uh, I guess the nature of our universal sin is still not, it's, it's still the sin of death, but we still go on through our, uh, through our family, or whoever God chooses after us. David may, may not have wanted it to be that way. He accepted that it was the wisest thing to do. It was God's will. And he peacefully let that transition take place. And I think bringing it to election day to day, that's, I think, a mark of a, a wise leader is when they know that it's time to make a transition or make a change and they can do it with grace and, and move forward to the next step. Mm. Um, yeah. And although David may not have been um, a perfect king or a perfect person, he definitely had all of his flaws, it, it, it does, I think, speak to David's relationship with God that he apparently, based on the prophets, he made that transition peacefully. Right. He laid the groundwork for Solomon to do a good job. Right. To have what he needed to fulfill the next step. That's right. Yeah. Which, which that's that's where the story of the temple building goes next is that um, uh, Solomon, whose name means peace on every side, as we said, uh, through him and during him, the Lord gives peace on every side. In fact, in our text, so you can go back to our 1 Chronicles 22, on verse 18, verse 18, is not the Lord God, your God with you? Has he not given you peace on every side? So Solomon is going to inherit a time of peace. Um, it was a lot of mess getting there. And what I think we need to do is, is remember that in the Old Testament, there was peace and war. And in the New Testament, there was peace and war. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, we look upon that time and, um, and need to remember that there were a lot of times when God's people lived in peace and God was a God of peace and God set up rulers who would keep peace. Not every king that came through uh, was a warrior king. Um, and there were days where they celebrated Israel's peace. And there are places in the Old Testament that say the Lord abhors violence. Now that doesn't make that is, that's not the impression you get much from that numbers part. But that's if you think, okay, God sent them to do all this and, and all that. Uh, to, to win, to have victory. Um, but, but the narrative shifts to it being about purification. It doesn't make it all it doesn't make it all sit well with us. Like it doesn't stop kind of giving us the, the heebie-jeebies, right? <laughs> but, but, but it's about purification. In the New Testament, Jesus says, and this is one that part of our, what we're going to study next week, happy are those who make peace because they will be called God's children. That's, that's basically the beatitude. That's a modern version. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. 
Jesus' whole life and ministry was marked by nonviolence, culminating in peace, or or is there violence? Violence. Violent Violent death. So there's violence in the New Testament, too. And it didn't come from Jesus. And so, yes, there is, Jesus does teach a new ethic. But we're, but if we just, if we just say the Old Testament, and we've read some, yeah, some, some rough parts of the Old Testament here, but if we just say the Old Testament was just how they were all violent back then, then we're just, we're just throwing it, everything into a, in a, in a paint with a really wide brush. Because there was also peace. There was Solomon. There was the Lord abhors violence. There was the commandment, do not kill. So we should not read backwards into First Chronicles a summary against David for being a warrior king. And we also shouldn't take the Old Testament tales of war making as justification for making war now. There might be times when we, when we are at war. But, uh, and that's one thing. But it's a different thing to say, uh, to invoke the Bible and say, well, it was okay back then, so we ought to do it now. Um, Jesus taught a different way. We'll talk about that next time. But we do not now live in a time and place in which the Lord has called us or any other nation to war the way David did in the Lord led David in First Chronicles. Um, we're in a we're we're not in the same time as when as when David when God led David to go to war and build the temple. You know, we're we're each time is just in the Old Testament is different, and we have to interpret the time now and say, well, what what's for example when it comes to war or peace in Jerusalem? What are we you know, what what time is God calling us to now? But there's still fighting over that. I mean, there's fighting. The Palestinians, the Israelis, right. I mean, they're still so, so, warring right. with one another. So what's different? So well, and, and should so what time what should what does God call for? That's I, I think that of course when you go back, this historically, this is how they fought. That's why they was told to get rid of the women, the old you know, because that's what they did. He didn't do what they were the war rules of war at that time that time. And if you don't follow the rules of war, then you can be subjected to the power, more powerful. Of right. course, today, we live in a time of, we, we are always prepared for war. We spend huge amounts of our budget on, yeah. on getting ready for war. Yeah. The deterrent is that we, if you, the ones who've got the most, biggest weapons, most yeah. threatening weapons, perhaps can keep a world order. Yeah. And so, I mean, throughout history, take us to the, you know, the time of the Romans, that, Warfare had advanced to a different style. So I mean, we, this is this is what they did. It's like that was historically the accurate way. Wasn't that David invented this? It was what he was responding to. So today we respond with, I mean, if there if we were so feeling that we we're just going to have peace, then we could just cut the whole military budget. Yeah. And give it to the poor or whatever. Yeah. Uh, or give it to the rich so they wouldn't have to pay less taxes, whatever. That's what we're doing. And um, so, you know, I mean, there's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's what, you know, we have to look at the times we're in. Yeah. And, that's, like that's Jesus, yeah. render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's yeah. unto God. So it's yeah. it's almost like a two, you're, you're following a two-fold path. Well, and you just, hope that you can right. interject the teachings of Jesus in every aspect of your life, right, including right. the concept of war. The fact that we have peace ta- talks and you know about the environment and various issues that we deal with, those are efforts. Those are examples to me that we are trying to solve our world problems in a peaceful manner. But at the same time, because there are evil situations in the world, we can't leave our people subjected to their evils we have to be prepared to to take up for ourselves yeah yeah well, that's the thing that's the difference between now they we have the capability 
to destroy the whole world right now. Back then they did, but right now we push the button, that's it. We're not sitting there anymore. That's right. Talk about the time check. Right now. Well, but we also, another issue now is not only weapons, it's the internet. That, they're, they're weaponizing that. And it's used in awful ways to undermine, it's, it all amounts to lies. Lies are, I, I shudder when I think about all of the lies that have been told and misinformation and how people are manipulating people with this. Yeah. It is truly brainwashing. And that is, and that's, I mean, Russia, you know, has yeah. admitted that they probably manipulate. Not that they came over here and maybe stole ballots, but they perhaps put into the internet doubts or, you know, news that really wasn't news or people that believe in these far off theories about things. They don't yeah. want they don't want to face reality. They they're more interested in listening to the things that aren't real. Yeah. So it's it's that to me is a war in itself right now. Yeah, it's war information war. Uh Lee's been uh, I, some, yeah, I, I, I just had a question about the context of the wars that Moses and, and David were they it kind of goes back to that comment. Were they Protecting themselves, were they were they being attacked and they were defending themselves? Mm. Oh, so I think so. They they were going in and they needed that land. They were told in to the land, and they needed that stuff to bring back and build the temple. Okay, well, although that timber and gold and bronze. So that's kind of like nowadays we go after the the gold and the uranium and everything else that belongs in other places. Okay, I don't. I'm not defending it, I'm just trying to understand the context of what yeah. oil was. I mean, oil is, you know, black gold, Texas tea, whatever, <laughs> uh, whatever Beverly Hillbillies it is, right? <laughs> yes. it's, it's, it's all it's all a consolidation of time. We, we've been told since the end of the, since the end of specific time, this is consolidation for Israel, right. the chosen people. Right. And it's also a consolidation of what uh, if, if Jesus was a descendant of David, throughout what God told David to do, uh, would Christ have been possible until these things were, until all of these acts uh, through history were done, were they completed? They had it. They had a time and place to be completed. Mm -hmm. And so, at, at, at a particular at a particular time and place, though as horrific as they are, because. I, I, I think I think it's also telling uh, that even though these things are horrific, that they did have a time and place to be completed, mm. and that um, certain steps along the way had had to be taken, um, or the, uh, the what I'm trying to say is. That they had to be completed through history at that time. Yeah. Right. And uh, that if they if they weren't, perhaps um, they were they were because they were not done through God had them to be done through human history for to be understood. Right. Then God's will had to, they were not completed right. in a way in which humans could not understand. Yeah. Retrospection, right. yeah, right. yeah. We've got the because yeah. one of the things, that, one of the things I think that we've that we've lost is we've lost the idea of faith because we're having to do things. We're thinking like, well, since we haven't seen the end of uh, the reemergence of God in history, then we have to do it ourselves. But then, because we've done it ourselves. Uh, we have not had we, we've we've lost the idea of faith, and so since because we haven't seen the end of it because well, we, we were, were promised that we went out and counted the troops yeah and, mm. and, and, and we're counting the troops now. Mm. Mm. Well, Solomon said, "There's nothing new under the sun." <laughs> so, <laughs> if I mean, we can we can see parallels. We can go in there and instead of saying the Midianites, we can say the Vietnamese or we can say the Ukrainians or the Russians or whatever, it lays out the same way. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is how am I going to respond in my little world, for me anyway, in my little world, how am I going to respond having this wisdom? How's that going to help me 
make a better decision than David made, maybe, or yeah. Moses, or whatever, so that I make a difference. Unless you're one of the women being targeted. Wow. That's a, that's a whole... That's I know, a, I'm, just, a, I'm just saying. That's a good point, but, but yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying. Just saying, that's right. And I hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> This builds on what Rachel said, but my my understanding of the Chronicles thing here is something that I go back to in my mind a lot, and that is that the periods of violence and war need to happen, just like Matt was saying too. Yeah. For the unfolding of the main big history from a huge perspective, yeah. God is in charge. And yeah. I feel like those periods are awful for the people that live there and live through it. But it's it's this is God's choice to do it this way. And every violent period ends up with a peaceful period. You know, um, and I can't understand why God wants to do it this way. But it seems to me that it's very um, it, it's laid out there for us like that. So that for instance, in Ukraine. Um, for us to sit back and not support those people, um, I think would be very wrong. Even though we're adding to the war, you know, we're making whatever, um, we're pouring weapons in, we can't sit back, and eventually that will be resolved some way in God's purpose. Mm -hmm. But we just have to do the live other through end. these bad times. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to do the other book in. I think God works through our bad choices. Mm. Yes. Yes. I'm not, I'm not going to say God causes these world events to happen so that his plan can come in. He works through our arrogance. Mm. Mm. Well, I agree. And, I agree with that. Yeah, he works through our arrogance and thinking that we've got the right idea and we've or, got the right answer. Or our general brokenness well, in the world. And well. the general brokenness, whatever, you know, but we, I'm part of the brokenness and I can fix it. Who says yeah. we're on the right side of Ukraine? Well, well, we're supporting Ukraine, but who's supporting What gives us the arrogance to think that we're on the right side of this? Maybe okay. God's plan is... Well, that's, all, that's all another track. I can tell you. Let's, let's bring it back in. Let's, yeah. let's, let's reel it back in. But, but he's telling you, look at the Holocaust. That was because of... Yeah. 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 Imperfect decisions and people allowing people to come to power, yeah, and listening to that arrogance. Yeah, we are a global world today. We yeah. are not isolationist. Yeah. We have to pay attention to what goes on. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, we are our brother's keeper. Yeah, everywhere. That's a lot of lot to be said for that. Let's let's bring it back around. I want to remind us. <laughs> I want to remind us that. Uh, What's uh, what's ha what is November 11th? Um, Veterans, Veterans Day, and what else is it? Armistice oh, Day, gosh. right? And at 11 o'clock. Uh, 11, 11, 11, 11. Yeah. Uh, if you has anybody ever been in England when at that time? Uh, what they tell me, you know, tourists who go and all that kind of stuff. They said it it literally just stops and shops close up and people stand on the street and take take off their hats and cars stop and everything just stops. And um, so, uh, in fact, uh, uh, recently the, uh, there are some very compelling movies that don't, uh, that don't really glorify war as much as um, they have a, a, a very amazing ability to try to give you a, just a glimpse because not the only one here probably has a glimpse of what that's like is and forgive me unless I'm forgetting another veteran but of war but but Greg is a veteran of war and um, and uh, and and uh, but the new one uh, the new all quiet on the Western Front is on Netflix I think and it's um, it's very powerful um, also uh, Dunkirk was a few years ago, and then Saving Private Ryan was all uh, was also compelling. And but now, uh, anyway, the Bible encourages us to anticipate the continuity and providence of God's purposes. So we we're coming from this text 
appreciating this whole idea of the warrior king passing the crown over to the builder king. And as we said, um, each king brings their particular strengths and their tasks. Each era and age from the Romans to the Cold War, as we talked about earlier, you know, brings its particular uh, issues. I'm reading a very interesting book about Raven Rock and the um, continuity of government and all that, and all the history of all that. Um, so, as as uh, like Solomon was for Israel, Christ is our peace, as uh, was prophesied in places like Micah five five. The full significance of the continuity of God's purposes being worked out in Jesus cannot be fully appreciated unless we study texts like we study today. So today's text is a preview, if you will, to get you primed for next week's text. So if you have to be away next week, watch the video, right, Doug? But, but this week's text and the discussion doesn't answer all the questions because we're going to see next week how Jesus begins to change the equation. Um, and while, but with, but we're not going to just um, read Jesus back into the Old Testament and say, why weren't they as good as he was? You know? Why didn't they do as good as he did? He's a game changer, okay? He's a, he's a world changer. But through Christ Jesus, God has made clear to us that God would have this be a time of of uh, that that Jesus's time would be a time of peace and, and nonviolence, and Jesus didn't call anybody to war. Um, he he uh, he suffered under war and under violence. But uh, but we'll talk about that. Um, so uh, so but but in the meantime, uh, are there any other veterans besides Greg among us? Oh, speaking of, speaking of uh, <laughs> I know, I know. We had Bible study and we're studying about war and stuff. It's Ronnie Massey. Oh. Uh, okay. Isn't this also the Old Testament to me also seems to be about a series of particulars? Yeah. Versus the ideas of universal. Yeah, yeah. But you have you also have particular overtones in the New Testament as well. Definitely. But but, but it's, it's, particularisms I think are meant as examples for the for road building and mm -hmm. to be towards the universes. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and it's kind of it's the same way we always have today as students who can say uh, Nothing of the sun. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's, 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 yeah. The more advanced we become, uh, the more uh, the more we end up lacking. Mm. It's hard. Things are much more nuanced. And, um, are there any other veterans besides Greg? Uh, okay. Not 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 Vietnam, but okay. In service. I would say uh, Wayne Miller. Wade's service, that's right. We honor Wade's service. And, uh, I like what Wade said, and he did time. Which yeah. Prison, which yeah. prison were you in? I know, that <laughs> sounds like it. I spent four years underground in Montana. Oh. Mm -hmm. if, if, if we wanted to, we could have ended everything right then. Just turn the button. I, I'd like to um, talk to you about that book I'm reading, and about, about it's, it's about that and all the. Um, yeah. Stuff. Uh huh. Yeah. It's it's I very. It. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It works on the I bet. Uh, I bet. But you know that that is all a good uh, prelude to our prayer to give thanks to God for uh, that that we uh, for for the peace we have we do experience um, and that we take for granted, right? And. Um, for the people around the world who are who are not experiencing that peace, and uh, that God will help us to be uh, peacemakers, as 
in, in whatever situation that looks like. And that might look a little, that might look really different in Ukraine than it does in Beaufort right now. But we'll figure it, we'll, we'll talk about it, and we'll see what Jesus has to say next time, all right? He, he better get his word in, right? What did you okay. say the name of your book is? The, the what? Your book that you're reading. Oh, um, Raven, Raven. Raven Rock. Raven Rock, uh, I don't know if that's the exact title. I'll bring up, it's a, an e-book, so, I mean, it's an audio book, so I'll, I'll write it down and okay. get it for you all next time. It's, a, it's just a, um, a sort of a chronological take through the different eras of, you know, so from, World War, end of, from the end of World War II to, to today and um, all the things. Okay, um, next time is Matthew 5, 38 through 48, and... I think I was mistaken earlier. That's not the beatitude exactly. That's going to be uh, concerning retaliation. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. Uh, so that's we're going to go there, and then uh, then we'll go to Ephesians, and then we'll go to the end of Matthew to uh, uh, two. Okay. All right. Uh, are you ready for closing? Yes. All right. Heavenly God, thank you for pear bread, and thank you for um, for peace, and uh, for uh, living in um, nonviolence uh, with our neighbor uh, in, in in our lives and, and most of our experiences. But at the same time, we know that this is a broken world, and uh, we are not uh, magically protected from violence or from uh, war. Uh, we are, uh, as Christians, uh, called to witness to your love and to Jesus' ways. And one of the most challenging parts of doing that is figuring out what your will is. But you were very clear to the kings uh, of Israel about your will. And uh, we receive their experiences, David and Solomon, we think about what they went through, and we ask that um, that you would give us the wisdom of experience and learning from their experiences. And we ask that you would help us remember our, our veterans, um, those uh, living and past, uh, who, uh, who, who have passed away in war or since war, uh, times of war, but let us just uh, remember that uh, that peace is is hard won, and uh, it's not a given, and uh, uh, and let us not take it for granted, especially this on this election day too. Uh, be with uh, all those election processes that have been so hard won by by war and uh, and held together with peace and hold them together with peace. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.